This is the word of God. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us, uh, God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I've also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned uh, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mark. Well, if you closed your Bible, I invite you to open it back up to Colossians 4. We have been, if you're visiting or new, we've been making our way um, verse by verse, sometimes word by word through this book, and uh, we are nearing the end of our study. We have just one more uh, week next Sunday looking at the last section, but today we're looking at a very uh, brief uh, but very rich text, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Retired Air Force Colonel Gene Cirillo once said, The Army will never control the ground under the sky if the Air Force doesn't control the sky over the ground. In other words, modern warfare requires a, a, attacking on two fronts. It requires boots on the ground, but also planes in the air. Since World War I, this has been the winning strategy for every major combat, a, a two-fold, two-pronged attack. Of course, today we have drones that can go overhead, and we have robotic tanks that we can send in, but the principle remains the same. If, if an army is going to advance, it needs to have both a ground attack and it needs to have air support. Well, I think that's a great picture of what Paul is teaching us in our passage today in Colossians chapter 4. If you are a Christian in the room, then you are in the Lord's army. And the Lord has given his army a mission. And that mission is to advance the gospel. And what we will learn in our text today is that the gospel advances in a very similar way to how armies advance. Throughout Colossians that we've been studying this book, Paul has been stressing one central truth about Jesus. A, a simple but life-changing truth. Three words, Jesus is Lord. And he has shown us over this book how the lordship of Jesus makes a difference. Last week we saw in our homes, in our work, in our marriages, previous weeks in our own personal lives, in our church life, in every aspect of life. And now Paul's going to turn his attention to our life outside of the church and our homes, but really to, to the world that is around us. And, and Paul's assumption in this text is that if you know Jesus is Lord, then you will want other people to know Jesus is Lord. In fact, let's, let's test Paul's assumption. Okay, if you consider yourself a Christian, whether you're a church member or not, you consider yourself a Christian. If you want to see the gospel go to our neighbors, to our nation, and to the ends of the world, would you raise your hand? All right? Wonderful, and put them down. By the way, I'm glad you raised your hands, because if you didn't, this sermon was about to take a real different strange turn real fast. Okay, so good. So, so Paul, listen, Paul, Paul's assumption is right, that those who know the lordship of Christ want other people to know the lordship of Christ. So, so the question, brothers and sisters, is not should the gospel advance. The question is how should the gospel advance? And Paul is going to show us that, that the gospel advances, if you will, like armies advance. 
It, it requires something in the air and something on the ground. The air support is what we call prayer. And the ground attack is what we call witnessing. Paul sets before us this two-fold, this two-pronged strategy. And, and a church that wants to see the gospel advance like, like we just did in raising our hands, a church that wants to see the gospel advance must be committed to both of these priorities, to pray and to witness. That is the Lord's winning strategy. Now, I know sometimes when preachers talk about praying, some people start to feel guilty. And that sometimes when preachers talk about witnessing, other people start to feel guilty. Well, I'm going to talk about prayer and witnessing, so we're all going to feel guilty in some form or fashion. But, but listen, that's, that is not my goal today. My goal this morning is for you not to simply see praying and witnessing as a duty, but I want you to see it as a privilege. I want you to leave here today not feeling guilty, but feeling ready, ready to pray, ready to witness, ready to advance the gospel to our neighbors, to our nation, and yes, even to the ends of the world. So how do we do that? Well, that's what our text will show us. This is a simple text and a very simple sermon. You will notice it is also a short text, but I do not promise a short sermon. Okay. How do we advance the gospel? Two ways. Very simple. Number one, we pray. And number two, you witness. Even a child can understand that. So, so how do we do? Let's, let's unpack both of those together. First of all, Paul tells us in verses two through four, if we want to advance the gospel, number one, we must pray. Pray. Look what he says there. Devote yourselves to prayer keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. And watch this, verse 3, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open to us a door for the word. So do you see the prayer? He gives this general command, but then he gives it this pointed specific encouragement that the gospel, that the word that is the message of Christ, the gospel of Christ will be able to advance and to spread in places that it hasn't gone before. So if we want to do that, what do we start with? Well, he says in verse 2, first we must devote yourselves to prayer. That's the main command. Pray, Paul says. Make it your habit to pray. And it, it, it's an ongoing command. Keep on praying. Keep busy about praying. Make this a regular part of your day. We all wake up with a to-do list, whether it's written down or just sort of in the back of our head. Paul says, make sure prayer is on your to-do list. Devote yourselves to pray. Some of your Bibles say be steadfast or continue. It's not so much about quantity, all that could be included. It's really about consistency. Think of it this way. You ever have, you ever have a friend, you know, you're just talking about, you know, TV shows and they say, uh, you say, I'm looking for a new show. And they say, hey, you should try this certain show, you know, streaming online. And you go, okay, I'll give it a shot. So you start watching the show, and you know, a week or two later, your friend goes, so what do you think about the show? And you go, eh. And they go, what? What episode are you on? And you're like, I don't know, three or four? And they go, oh, wait till you get to season two. Oh my gosh. Right? What, 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 what's their point? Their point is, you got to be devoted, Right? It's going to pay off. That's the promise. It will pay off. You got to keep watching. That's what Paul says about prayer. See, some of us struggle in prayer because we give up too soon. Paul says persistence is essential. What did the Lord Jesus tell us? Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And so the secret to a prayer life is, is to work at it is to be consistent. In fact, one of the most helpful pieces of advice I've ever heard about this, it's, it's, it's an old saying from the Puritans. Now, if you've experienced this, you will understand this. If you've not experienced this, you probably won't understand it. But the Puritans used to encourage each other with this, and they would say it this way. They'd say, pray until you pray. Pray until you pray. 
I've done this many times in my life. In fact, most of my prayer times, it seems. I sit down to pray, and at first it's kind of cold and kind of rote, and my words are fumbling and maybe mumbling and sort of stumbling. But then as I do it and things come into my mind, I say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. And so I push it aside, and I begin to confess my sins and praise God. And as I do that, I begin to thank God. And as I thank God, I think of things to pray for, and I start getting some sort of spiritual momentum as I pray. And it's as if that happens, then God's word comes to mind in certain people. And before I realize it, what seemed like a struggle and a labor is now a joy. Pray until you pray. Some of us stop praying before we ever get to praying. And that's what Paul's calling us to, be devoted to prayer. And by the way, who's he tell this to? Verse 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer. Last week, he spoke to six different groups. So in other words, he's saying, wives, pray. Husbands, pray. Children, pray. Parents, pray. Slaves and masters, that is, employees and bosses, pray. Everyone that can pray should pray. No one is exempt from this command. Now, it's not always easy. That's why he adds the encouragement, keeping alert in it. Some of your translations say being watchful in your prayers. When you read that phrase, you should probably remember that scene in the Gospels that the Gospels record in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus goes further in and there he prays, but he leaves the disciples, Peter, James, and John, to pray. And do you remember what happened? Think, think about it. Jesus himself literally commands the disciples, like physically in their presence, sit here and pray. And what happens? They fell asleep. You ever fall asleep when you're praying? Right? And Jesus comes back and says what? Keep watching, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. If your prayer life is a struggle sometimes and you want to fall asleep, you are in good company with the disciples. And Jesus says, that's why if you want to succeed, you must be watchful. You, you, you must keep your mind in the game. Be alert. Stay keen. Again, if you want a piece of practical advice for this, oftentimes a good prayer life requires a good prayer list. So something to give you some focus, something to help you moving in a right direction. But Paul says there, be watchful. Now, now think about that command. In other words, he's saying here, if you struggle with prayer, just, just open your eyes. You say, oh, I don't know what to pray for. Just look around you, he says. Be watchful. In fact, I would challenge you, don't just watch the news or sort of scroll your feed. Use that as, as a time to pray. I, I don't know about you, when, when you heard the news over the last couple of days of the earthquake in Morocco, I think this morning said over 2,000 people have died in that earthquake. And as I read that, I, I instantly thought of pastors having to do funerals and, and how much grief and pain and people weeping. And, and I began to pray for the churches and the Christians that may be there and the opportunity to witness among those who do not know Christ. So, so be watchful. When you see a hurricane is moving towards the coast, pray for disaster relief workers and churches to be able to come along and serve and help those who are in need. Be devoted to prayer by keeping alert. And not only being watchful, but Paul says also being thankful. Verse 2, with an attitude of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is to prayer what laughter is to a good joke. It's the proper response. And not only is it the proper response, but, but once you laugh at a good joke, what, you want to laugh some more. You want to hear another good joke. Right? There's a sense in which... That praying and, and being thankful, they go together because as we see God's answer to prayer, as we give thanks, it leads us to, to pray some more. And so if you find yourself and you're not prayerful, ask yourself, am I ungrateful? Do I, do I stop and give thanks for all that I have, all that God's given to me? Thanksgiving primes the pump for your prayer life. It, it gets it going. And so Paul says, if, if you're going to be devoted to prayer, give thanks, open your eyes, be watchful, and continue to pray. So that's his general reminder in verse 2. But then notice verse 3, he puts a point on it, praying at the same time for us as well. In other words, verse 2 is a general call to prayer, 
And he says, I want you to pray, you know, like you do for normal stuff. You pray for sick people. We all know somebody who's grieving, somebody who's at a crossroads, somebody who's maybe got an estranged child or parent and they're not sure what to do or a tough marriage. Paul says, pray for all of that. But as you're praying for all of that, specifically, he says, at that same time, pray for us. That what? That God will open to us a door for the word. Now, I love that specific request because, again, it shows Paul's heart. His heart was not just to pray. It was to pray so that the gospel will advance. By the way, it's remarkable that he says that. Notice, pray for uh, uh, that God will open us a door that I may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also, what, been imprisoned. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had been Paul, I would have prayed Pray that God will open up my door, my jail cell, so that I can get out. He's literally in prison while he's writing this. And he's, while he's there, he's saying, you know what landed him in prison? Preaching the gospel. And Paul says, I, I just need more opportunities to preach the gospel. It's like he can't get enough of it. And he's saying, pray for me to have more and more such opportunities because Paul's consuming consuming desire was to see the gospel advance. Paul would have raised his hand, yes, let's take it to our neighbors, to the nations, to the end of the world, and that's only going to happen if we pray. Paul says, pray that God will open up a door for us. Notice, by the way, who he's depending on to do this, that God will open a door. My friends, I know there's, there's a lot of challenges in our world and there's a lot of difficulties, but we are not sitting around and waiting for Congress to open a door. We are looking for God to open our doors. And by the way, God is an excellent locksmith. Did you know that? He knows how to open closed country doors and open closed hearts and open closed situations that you think, oh, that person will never. Paul says, have you prayed? Because God can open the door. By the way, his conviction here is that God was ultimately the one in charge of every situation and every circumstance. Listen, don't, don't talk to me about believing in the sovereignty of God unless you pray. That's what prayer is. A confession that God is sovereign. God has to open the doors. God has to create the opportunities. God has to move on men's hearts. My friends, do do you look to God like that when you pray? This is a metaphor for for Paul, opening a door. It means a gospel opportunity. Some of you are old enough to remember D. James Kennedy from uh, Coral Ridge, I believe it was in Florida. D. J. Kennedy used to say, pray for divine appointments. You know what a divine appointment is? Where God brings a person, a situation right in your path. I love D. James Kennedy, but I prefer what another theologian taught me named Nancy Scarlett, my mom. She just calls them God moments. You can't talk to my mom very long without her telling you about her last God moment. I was the chiropractor, and I had a God moment. I was at the grocery store, and I had a God moment. I was the doctor. I had a God moment. She goes to the doctor a lot, by the way. But, but there's these God, what am I, an opportunity, a door. That only God, do you wake up with that kind of expectation? See, sometimes the doors are open. We don't even see them because we're not looking for them. Paul says, pray for them and then look for them so that we may be able, notice this, to speak forth the mystery of Christ. Now, what does he mean there, the mystery of Christ? Well, we've seen this word already in Colossians. It sounds mysterious, I know, but it's not really mysterious. Um, in fact, the word that came to mind as I was thinking of it this week, it's actually what we refer to, this is a goofy illustration, okay? I don't know if this helps, but this is what came to mind. You know how, you know, for decades people were asking the government, like, do you guys investigate UFOs? I told you it's goofy. And they go, oh, we can neither confirm nor deny, whatever. And then like 10 years ago, they released all these <laughs> programs and files, right? And, and, and people called that the disclosure, Right? It it referred to something that that was not known, but now is known. Now, I'm not talking about UFOs, so stop thinking about that, okay? But it was something that was not known that is now known. That's what this word mystery means. 
It's not that Christ is mysterious, like you can't, there's an enigma, a riddle to know Jesus. No, no, no. He's saying this message of Christ, it was something that wasn't previously known, but now it's known. And I want you to pray for me that I can go disclose Jesus to other people. Because they might be walking in darkness. This might be hidden from them, but I want to bring them into the light. I want them to see what they don't now currently see. I want to disclose Christ to them. And my friend, if you're here this morning, maybe earlier you didn't raise your hand because you're, you're not a Christian. You, you, you don't know. You maybe came with a friend, family member. We're super glad you're here this morning. And, and I want you to understand that this right here, this phrase, this is what we are all about. That's why all the hands went up earlier today. Because we are convinced we, we have, that the, the gospel of Christ has been disclosed to us. You say, say what, what does that mean? What is this mystery? It's, it's, it's not a mystery. It's that God created us, male and female, and he created us to have a relationship with him, to walk with him, to talk with him, to know him. But we rebelled against God. We sinned against God. And, and God in his justice and his holiness, he, he came to, to pour out his wrath against sin. And yet in his kindness, he sent his son to bear the penalty for our sin. To stand in the gap between us. As Paul says that in his body on that tree, he took the punishment, the penalty for our sins. And God was satisfied in what Christ did. And he, he proved that, he showed that to us through the resurrection of Christ three days later. Put a stamp of approval that, yes, in Christ, all the promises of God are yes and amen. The grace of God, the mercy of God, the, the, the forgiveness and salvation of God is ours in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, if you didn't know that message, my friends, now you do. There is life waiting for you. There is forgiveness waiting for you. There is a family waiting for you. And if you walked in here and you did not know that you can know God, my friends, here's the good news. You can know God today. Right now, repent of your sins and trust in Jesus. Turn to him in faith. Look to him and him alone for your salvation and your forgiveness. Paul says that mystery has dawned on those of us that know Christ, and we want others to know that mystery, to be brought in on the disclosure. Paul says, I, I, I'm burdened to share Christ with those who don't know, so I need God to open a door. Notice he says there at the end of verse 4, that I may make it clear that the way I ought to speak. Paul puts a point on it here. Pray for clarity. Pray for precision. But pray that I can say the right words in the right order at the right time. But pray that I will be able to speak in a way that other people will clearly understand the message of Jesus. By the way, I, I think it's interesting here when Paul talks about those who the door is closed. We want God to open up a door that they might know the mystery of Christ. You know, sometimes when you think about unbelievers or those you know that, that don't know Christ, people that you might disagree with, sometimes it can be very, very tempting to be dismissive of them or, or maybe to, to, to just sort of feel hostile towards them because they're maybe politically or economically or ideologically or morally, they feel like they're on the other team. And so you feel yourself growing hostile towards them. I love what D.A. Carson said. He said, we should resolve to never put people down except on our prayer list. What a challenge. To not see that person as the enemy, but as the mission field. They need Jesus. They need the mystery of Christ. And my friends, it is really hard to be bitter towards someone that you're genuinely praying for. Paul says, pray that doors will be open that I can bring the gospel to bear. So if we're going to, before we can speak to men about God, we must first speak to God about men. If we're going to advance the gospel, Paul says, we need air support. We need to launch our, our prayers into the situation room of heaven. And we need to look to our commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ, to give us his directions, to give us his assignments, to lead us to complete his mission, because he will build his church. Will we be part of that? We can all be part of that when we devote ourselves to prayer. By the way, Paul knew that this is how Doors were opened. 
Paul knew by experience this is how God advanced the gospel. You don't have to turn there. I'll just summarize it for you. Paul's first missions trip is found in Acts 13 and 14. Okay, you may remember it. The trip ends in chapter 14. I believe it's verse 27. At the end, he comes back to the church that sent him out. He comes back after the mission trip, and they had a mission moment. And, and Paul stood up and said, quote, reported that God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. So the mission trip ended by Paul saying, God has opened a door so that unbelievers can come to know him. That's how his first mission trip ended, Acts 14. Do you know how that passage starts in Acts 13, verse 1? The church of Antioch was fasting and praying. That's no coincidence. The church was seeking God and praying, and the Holy Spirit said, set apart Paul, send him out, and God saw to it that Paul went where he needed to go so that doors would be opened and that unbelievers might come to know him. You know, a few weeks or months ago, we've shared a little bit about, we have a t group in our church who's praying about, thinking about church planting in New England, maybe possibly New Hampshire. And they've, as we've talked about them as leaders, they've made some trips, they've explored some of the ideas, and we've talked about it, and they've been saying, some of them are in seminary and new in life, saying, hey, it might be two years or three years. And in the back of my head as a pastor, I've been thinking, oh yeah, good, we got two years we got all this time to wait. And it occurred to me this week, no, that means we've got two or three years to pray. To pray. C could it be that God would send another great awakening through Forest Baptist Church? Through, through, through doors that have yet to be opened? We say, oh, New England, there's, it's not possible to plant a church. They said the same thing to Paul about the Gentiles. They, they will never believe. When God opens a door, they believe. My friends, can we give ourselves to pray? I suspect every one of us in this room do pray. But, but can I ask you in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the way that Paul says here, do you pray for the gospel to advance? Or are your prayers just for sick people and travel plans? Now, that's not bad or that's not wrong. We need to do that for sure. But are more of your prayers just about people being comforted or do you pray for people to be converted? Do we pray for God to raise up more missionaries from our church? You know, the last few weeks people say, man, we are so full. There's so many people coming to church. Praise God. Let's, what? Let's pray for God to send some of them away. I don't mean that in a nice way. I mean to send them to the mission field, right? That God would, would, would send those out from our midst. By the way, if you don't know how to do that, one of our missionaries, Charlie Adams, she is stateside right now. There are prayer cards in all the foyers. Go pick one up. Family, stick it on your fridge. Take it to work. Think about it. Pray for it. You say, well, she's not on the mission field. Yeah, she's not yet, but let's pray that God would open doors when she gets there, that the gospel could go forth. Grandparents, when you pray for your grandchildren at school, do you pray for them to be safe? Do you pray for them to be a good student? But do you also pray for them to be a good witness? Do you pray for your spouse as they go to their workplace that they might speak of Jesus? Paul says, if we're going to advance the gospel, we must pray. It's a vital thing, but it's not everything. That leads us to Paul's second command, verses 5 and 6. Paul tells us, number two, to witness. That The air support is prayer, relying and looking to God to open doors, and the ground attack, if you will, is to witness. What does that look like? Verse 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. That phrase, conduct yourselves, it means to just you, how you walk. It means your overall lifestyle. He's talking about your day in, day out, Monday through Saturday, mornings, afternoons, whether you're at the gym, whether you're at your workplace, whether you're in traffic, whether you're at the store, whether you're in the, the carpool line, where, wherever you are. Paul says, make sure that you conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders. Now, by the way, if you write in your Bibles, Underline that phrase, with wisdom. That's actually the emphasis here. In other words, Paul is saying that, 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 listen, the key to evangelism is not being loud or even being persuasive. It's being wise. It's 
It's, it's knowing how you should respond and speak to a certain person at a certain time in a certain way. And let's be honest, that is the majority of our Christian life, is it not? Most of your day is not spent in the black and white of the Ten Commandments. Right? I mean, there's some things, but generally speaking, you're not sitting around like looking at the Ten Commandments. Your, your life is spent thinking about how do I interact with this person at work? Or this, you know, it's like th- this coworker, right, is an atheist and hates Christians, and I don't know if I should tell him I'm a Christian or not, or how do I talk about this? What, what if that distant relative invites me to their, their, you know, their gay wedding? Do I go? Do I not go? Do I recognize it? Do I not? What, what do I do? Or you find yourself with the, with the people in the apartment next to you that are loud and obnoxious at times they shouldn't be, and you think, should I report them? Should I talk to them? Should I not? Right? This is where life is lived. And those situations, there's not a Bible verse for them, so how do you decide what to do? Paul says you need wisdom. Wisdom is the pathway forward. By the way, good news James 1 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, because he gives liberally to everyone who asks him. God might not give you the answer you want, but he will give you the wisdom you need. So Paul says we should show wisdom towards who? He says towards outsiders. Now, that's not an insult. That's just a statement of fact. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, that's That's talking about you, somebody who's outside of Christ. We would say if you're a believer, you are in Christ. Until you're a believer, you are outside of Christ. And by the way, this picture here of inside, outside, right, this this reminds us that Christianity is a missional religion, right? We, we, We insiders want outsiders to become insiders, And we recognize those differences, longing for others to come into the truth. And by the way, this this shows up all throughout Scripture, right? Adam and Eve in the garden, they were walking with God. They were inside the garden. They disobeyed. Where did they go? They went outside. Noah's ark, guess where? Inside there was safety and protection. Outside was wrath and death. When Israel was obeying God, they were in the promised land. It was great. When they disobeyed God, the Babylonians came and took them outside. Push forward to Revelation 22. What is the vision of all things at the end in the new Jerusalem, the heavens, the new earth? There are those inside who know the Lord Jesus Christ worshiping around the throne, but outside are the dogs and the liars and the idolaters, and there they will stay for all eternity. The inside-outside distinction is serious business. That There are people who do not know Christ, and they will perish for all eternity without Christ. And so Paul says that that's why every opportunity with an outsider, it might be a gospel moment. It might be a gospel privilege. It might be a moment in which you can speak grace and love and you can show them the way of Jesus. So he says here, make sure that you do so with grace. He says there to make the most of your opportunity. By the way, for some of us, this may be where the challenge lies. Conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders. Ask yourself, do you even do you spend time in the week with outsiders? Some of us surround ourselves with just insiders. Right? If you live at Liberty, you don't know anything about Christian bubbles, right? You know nothing about that. I, I've told students before, one of the best things you do, find a local church, go to class if you're at Liberty, and then get a job at Sheets or Kroger or somewhere like that. Spend time with outsiders. In fact, Jesus did. In fact, so much so that they said, oh, you're a drunkard, right, and a glutton. He was literally a friend of sinners. Do do you, are you friends with any unbelievers? Like, like, like you had them over for, for dinner, or you invite them over to watch a football game, or you'd go to their house and be invited Paul, Paul says we, we need to have those opportunities. In fact, the Corinthians misunderstood this, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people, but I did not mean the immoral people of this world, because otherwise, he says, you'd have to go to Mars. He says, you have to go out of the world. 
Paul, Paul says, no, we're supposed to rub shoulders with lost people. How else are they going to come to know Jesus? So he says, make the most of the opportunity. Buy up the time. Gobble up every chance that you have. It's a strange way to put it, but Paul says, be opportunistic for the gospel. Right? Every conversation, every interaction with a coworker, or a customer, or a, an employee, or, or your neighbor, or a, a classmate, or a teacher, everyone, it might, that might be the opportunity. And every one of us can look back in our lives, and we can see that moment when the gospel dawned on us. That conversation, maybe it was first after 50, but at some point, that moment came, and you look back and say, that is the moment when I came to faith in Christ. My friends, other people are waiting for that moment, and are in need of that moment. And Paul says, you may be the one God uses in that moment. So what do you do? Verse 6, let your speech always be with grace. Paul says, watch your words. Do your words adorn the gospel? Do do your words speak of, of God in a way in his grace that would invite people? He says there to let your words be with grace. That is to be gracious. That every interaction with the waiter, the waitress, the customer service person, yes, the spam caller on the phone, let your speech be seasoned with grace. As though, verse 6, with salt. We, We all know that salt makes everything taste a little bit better. Paul says, make every conversation a a, a salty conversation. Now, not salty in the way we always talk about it, but salty in a way that's that's like what Jesus said. I I don't know what this means. What does it mean to sprinkle in salt into my conversation? What did Jesus say? You are the salt of the earth. Do you know where he said that? In the Sermon on the Mount. You say, then what does it mean to, to be the salt of the earth, to speak in a salty way? Just go look at the Beatitudes. Blessed are the gentle. Are your words gentle? Blessed are the meek. Are your words humble or the arrogant? Blessed are the peacemakers. Or are your words stirring up trouble? Paul says, let your words be salty so that it adorns the gospel. By the way, I don't know if it's just my kids or not. If I ever say something at home that's kind of blunt or maybe even edgy, my kids go, Dad, that was spicy. (laughs) Sometimes what comes out of my mouth can be spicy, but Paul says, let's make sure our words are salty. Let's make sure our words, we choose them carefully, that we speak the truth in love with wisdom. And why do we do this? Paul says, Verse 6, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Paul assumes here that our lives, if we live under the lordship of Christ as husbands and wives, as employees, people are going to ask some questions. It's going to spark some curiosity. Why did you, why did you close your eyes before you ate? What, what does that mean? What, what is that book you're, you're reading? Right? Or why do you read your Bible so often? 1 Peter 3 says what? Always be prepared, ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. It doesn't mean that we have all the answers, but be ready to give the answer, to speak of of Jesus. Paul says that you should know how to respond to each person. By the way, I think this is a really important principle here. Evangelism is not a one-size-fits-all activity. Did you notice here, Paul's not... He's apparently not a big fan of canned gospel presentations. You know those scripts that you memorize when you're getting trained? Those aren't bad. They can be very helpful tools. But if you ever heard, you know, it's the old, uh, you know, if, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Sometimes we learn, here. oh, here's, here's how I share the gospel. And you'll be talking to someone and you're just trying to get all that out and not actually talk to the person you're talking to. But Paul says, you, if you want to be wise... Respond to them, to what they're dealing with, to what the questions they're asking, to where they might find themselves. We don't just turn evangelism into some robotic flow chart. Say this, say that, but but rather with nuance and with love and with winsomeness and a concern, we respond to each person. By the way, Jesus did this. 
Just go look at how he talked to Pharisees and how he talked to the woman at the well. Very different conversations, very same Jesus. So it may be that a conversation with our Roman Catholic neighbor or our conversation with our, with, with our atheist friend, it, it might look slightly different, but Paul says respond to each person. Be prepared to explain the mystery of Christ here or there and to do so with wisdom. Paul reminds us that we should be looking for others to share the gospel with. That our lives first are a testimony that would generate questions and then our words come behind it. Nobody was a better evangelist in some respects than D.L. Moody, if you know that name. Moody was passionate and emotional and very committed to seeing others come to Christ. Moody, like many, had critics, though, for some of his methods and his approaches. And a man wrote him one time to criticize him for some of his sermons and the way he said what he did. And Moody wrote back a letter, and this is what he said. He said, it's clear you don't like my way of doing evangelism. You raise some good points. Frankly, I sometimes do not like my way of doing evangelism. But I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. Yeah, that's, that's a real temptation though, isn't it? That's a real temptation. To, to criticize whether it's the preacher or that person. And to not actually ourselves be doing it. I agree with Moody. Sometimes I don't like the way that I do it. But my friends, we are called to do it. We're called to be faithful. C could that be said of you? Are, are you looking for opportunities to make the gospel known? Do, do your coworkers know you're a Christian? Do your classmates know you're a Christian? Do the people in your apartment complex know that you're a Christian? That if they had questions about the Bible or Christianity, that you're one of the people they would think of to come to? Paul says we should live in such a way that, that that's obvious, that that's known. Because as we do this, we will be able to advance the gospel. So, so where are your opportunities this week? At, at soccer practice? At your doctor's appointment? On your lunch break? Uh, talking to a neighbor? Where is an opportunity that maybe you've just overlooked in the past, but now you think, man, you know what, maybe... Maybe God will use this conversation. My friends, we are all, if we are in Christ, we are in the Lord's army. We raised our hands. Yes. Let's spread the gospel to our neighbors, to our nation, to the world. So, so which, which, which part of the attack do, do you need to work on this week? To, the, the air support of prayer? To truly, to truly depend upon God? To pray for missionaries and to pray for others? Or is it to, 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 to live in such a way that other people would know clearly she's a Christian? Clearly he's a Christian. So that you might have opportunity to speak of Christ. My friends, the gospel will advance. And this week, every one of us can be part of that. So let's pray and let's witness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would help us in the week that's ahead to advance the gospel as a church, as individuals, to both pray and witness. Lord, would you forgive us for our prayerlessness and our ungratefulness? Would you forgive us for our cowardice and our lack of faith, for being so consumed by the cares of this world that we forget about the the mission of your kingdom. And Lord Jesus, would you help us this week as moms and dads, as students, as neighbors and coworkers, as friends and family, that we might pray, that we might witness, and that we might see you open doors so that others might believe. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. And Father, for anyone here who doesn't know Christ, Lord, we do pray that they would receive the mystery of Christ for themselves. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.